that's John. <coughs> Excuse me. That would be a good thing. Are we on now? Thank you very much, John. And um, it's nice to see you out this morning. Uh, our pastor is on vacation for a couple of weeks, getting and taking a rest. And um, apparently I drew the short straw this time. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm looking forward to sharing the word with you this morning. But um, you know, it's hard to believe New Year's is almost here. And uh, we have hardly seen any snow yet. I saw a cartoon the other day where two snowmen were talking. And the one snowman said to the other one, I can't understand what happened to Ricky. He hasn't come back from Florida. <laughs> I'm just testing the audience, just to make sure you're awake. <laughs> Anyways, the title of my message this morning is called Deity and Humility. And I'd like to begin by reading a passage from Micah chapter 6 and um, verses 6 to 8 where the prophet Michael says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming into your presence this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to fellowship with one another, to be in your presence, to experience a time of worship and of praise and of thanksgiving and be reminded of your goodness to us. <clears throat> And Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is alive and it is sharp, and your word speaks to our hearts. And we pray, O oh God, that your word would speak to us today. We thank you, Lord, that your word contains life. And Father, that we might be um, challenged and encouraged and strengthened in our resolve to follow you today as we look into the, your word and your instructions to us. We thank you, God, for your presence with us. We pray for those who are not able to be with us today. We know there are some who are um, battling illness, and we pray, Lord, that you'd be with them, that you'd minister strength and encouragement to them wherever they are. And we thank you so much, Father, for what you're going to speak to us today and for what you're going to do in our hearts and our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we've just come through the Christmas season. And the events of the first Christmas speak to us of the humility of Jesus Christ. Of course, they speak to us of his love. They speak to us of his mercy. They speak to us of his grace, but also speaks to us of his humility. God in flesh, eternal king, Lord of lords, the almighty, took on human flesh, had a humble birth, lived a humble life, and he died an unspeakably horrible death on a Roman cross. It seems inconceivable to our human minds, doesn't it? Every other king from the beginning of time was either born a prince or he be and became a king, or he was appointed or chosen to be a king. But Jesus was a king before he was born. He was a king in the manger. He became a human body. And that's just, and Jesus' humble birth and everything that speaks about, um, about Jesus is such stark contrast to the values held by the ancient Greeks, or I could say probably the Romans and any other empire of that day, where humility was not considered a virtue. It was probably more of a weakness. And if Jesus was a perfect example of humility, then humility is a trait that God desires to see in us as followers of Jesus. Therefore, it should be of no surprise that the Bible has many references uh, exhorting us to be humble people. Before we look at humility, let's take a look at the opposite, which is pride. Humility could be, um, could be described as the personal quality of being free from arrogance and pride and having an acute sense of one's worth. I'm just going to read that again. 
humi uh, humility is the personal quality of being free from arrogance and pride and having an acute sense of one's true worth. Pride, on the other hand, is the opposite. It's arrogance, high-mindedness, conceit. And the scripture makes it clear that pride is in direct opposition to God. God cannot tolerate pride. There's a number of verses that I'd like to read for you this morning that speak to that. The first one is Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way, and the evil mouth I hate. I have to adjust my glasses a little bit. It's getting a little fuzzy from here to here. <laughs> then Proverbs verse 16, chapter 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 16 and 5 says that everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord Almighty. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. And then in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, Verse 16, John says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. Where did pride originate from? Well, the scripture makes it pretty clear. Before time, before the creation of the world, in heaven, there was one angel that stood out, and his name was Lucifer. The Bible describes him as being brilliantly gorgeous, and he was an angel of great status. But he became proud in his appearance, and he desired to become like God or equal with God. And somehow or other, he was able to convince one third of the angels in heaven to follow him. And it's hard to comprehend, I think, for us to understand how he could have so much influence that he could actually influence one third of the angels in heaven to follow him and to rebel against God. And it turned out in the re as a, there was a rebellion or a war in heaven and Satan was cast out. But you know, when we look around us today, we see his influence everywhere. Satan is a character of influence. The Bible says that he was the chief liar. He is a chief liar. He's a deceiver and he is a murderer. And so after this war of heaven, as he and his followers were cast out, Jesus was witness to that. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I was watching as Satan fell from heaven as lightning. And Satan has been deceiving people since the beginning of creation. And you know, it's disturbing today. People don't realize, I don't think the, um, there's this um, lack of understanding of the horrific nature of Satan. What we're seeing today is we're seeing a rise in satanic worship right in our culture. We're seeing this among some of the elites. We're seeing this among some, some of our entertainers, and it is on the rise. In fact, just recently, there was a, a statue or an idol of Satan was erected in Iowa in their, in their government building. And there was a, um, a former U.S. Marine. I think it was a former, he, and it was, he, was, he was part of the Marine Corps. And uh, he was a Christian man, and he, he heard about this. And he flew to Iowa just to see his own rage. He flew to Iowa to see this. And he said when he saw it, it was just, it was just so troubling just to stand before this, this um, figure uh, representing Satan. And he took something, and he smashed the head off this idol. And then he turned himself into the police. And so far as we've heard, there has not been any charges, charges laid. But that's kind of where we're at in society today, because nobody would remove that. And then he went and he smashed it. And you know, if we want a little bit of a picture of the horrific evil of Satan, all we have to do is look at what happened in Israel on October 7th. And you know, we might say that was all orchestrated in the tunnels of Hamas. That was orchestrated in the tunnels of hell. Every evil deed that man does originates with Satan. He is the one who directs. And we, unfortunately, are the ones that do his bidding. We go back to the Garden of Eden, and um, Satan appears to Eve as a serpent. And he twists the words which God had spoken to her and Adam regarding the tree of life. And what does he do? He appeals to their pride. He says if they ate of the forbidden fruit, their understanding would be complete, and they would be like God. And after eating the fruit, their eyes were opened, 
and they found themselves in a very dark place. As a result, they were cast out of the garden and the world was forever changed. God in his grace made provision for Adam and Eve to be able to come into fellowship, to restore fellowship with him, as God does for all of his people. But then we read in the, in the, the New Testament of the temptations of Jesus, how Satan showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world, it says, in a moment of time. And he said to Jesus, I will give you all this and their glory if you will bow down and worship me. If you will bow down and worship me. And of course, Jesus rebuked Satan and he said, the scripture says to worship God alone and to serve him and, certain, and Satan eventually left him. And then when we read at the end of the Bible, we read about the great tribulation and the rise of the Antichrist, who is the, going to be the embodiment of Satan. And he will demand the worship of all mankind. And you know, as we look in the, and as we watch what's happening and unfolding in the world today, this might not be as far off as we used to think it would be. We've all heard about the, I trust you've heard about the uh, World Economic Forum and the United Nations, and their goal is by 20 to 30 to have a single world government, a world dictator, one world currency, one world religion, and all these things fall right into line with what prophecy has been, taught, has been predicting in scripture. I'm not making any predictions, but 2030 isn't very far away if they're able to pull that off. But these examples clearly reveal that Satan is a creature totally obsessed with pride. He craves to be worshiped. So let's look at some examples in scripture where pride caused disastrous results for individuals. First of all, we're gonna look at Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter four, I'll read these verses for you. Daniel chapter four, starting at verse 28. It said, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. The king reflected and he said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself has built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, the voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you, it has been declared sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word was concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And then we jump down to verse 36. It says, at that time, my reason re returned to me. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. And my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty with and surpassing greatness was added to me. This was after he had recognized his sin. And then in verse 7, 37, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. There's a number of other illustrations we can look at briefly. We think of um, the story of David and Goliath and how the Philistines were camped on one side of the hill, valley and the uh, Israelites on the other side. And Goliath, this uh, mighty champion of the Philistines, would strut out in the valley every day and he would taunt the Israelites, asking them to send a man to fight him. And whoever won that fight would be, um, uh, they would, the other um, side would be subject to them. And um, not only was he mocking the Israelites, but he was also mocking their God. And David, who had come to see his brothers, was so upset and enraged when he heard Goliath mocking the God of Israel 
that he asked King Saul if he could go out and face this giant. And so Saul finally granted him permission. He went out with nothing but a slingshot, and he took him down and hacked off his head. And so here was this man of pride, of arrogance. You know, he thought he was infallible, and it was nothing but God who brought him down through his servant David. We think of King Saul then, who became jealous of David because of what David had done and because of all the accolades he was receiving, and that led to deep hatred for him, towards him, and caused David untold grief. And eventually it resulted in Saul and his son being killed in battle and their bodies hung on their enemy's city wall as an act of humiliation. Pride never leads to very good results, does it? And then we think of King Herod who was giving a speech and he was dressed in his royal attire and the adoring crowd began to cry out, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. And Herod in his pride refused to refute them. And it says that he was struck down by an angel of the Lord. He was eaten by worms and he died. Now, you know, pride is not always as dramatic and obvious as these examples. But, you know, generally it's easier to detect pride in others than it is in ourselves, right? It's easier for me to see the pride that you might have than it is for me to see the pride in my own heart, my own life. Oftentimes it's very subtle and it's hard to recognize in ourselves. But what are some of the results of pride? Well, we've seen some of the parts, very dramatic, very drastic results of pride. But pride clouds our judgment. It clouds our judgment. It causes us to make poor decisions. It can destroy relationships. It can divide Christians. It causes church splits. It can keep us from reaching out to the lost. And there's many other things I'm sure we could think of, but in the end, it always dishonors the Lord. Now let's look at humility, the opposite. Humility as seen in Jesus Christ, the perfect example of humility. You know, it goes beyond human comprehension that deity and humility could coexist. Deity and humility coexisting. It's hard to fathom that, isn't it? But this is clearly what we see in Jesus Christ. We look at his birth and everything about his birth reflected humility. Every detail orchestrated concerning his birth identified him with the poor, the lowly, and the unimportant in society. First of all, he was not born in an elaborate palace. He did not have, Mary didn't have expert midwives to assist her in the birth. He was born in a stable. His crib was a manger, a cattle trough, the king of glory. His parents were commoners. They were not people of wealth, prestige, or influence. The first guests who were invited to see the child, the Christ child, were shepherds. They were men of absolutely zero social status. In fact, shepherding was considered to be unclean, an unclean profession in that day. And then we look at Jesus' baptism. You'd expect he'd be baptized in the atmosphere of a beautiful temple by an elaborately robed priest but no, he was baptized in the Jordan River by a roughly clothed man who lived in the wilderness, John the Baptist. And then we take a look at his disciples. By and large, they were common men, mostly uneducated, not men of social status or influence. In fact, one of them was a tax collector who was hated by society. And then we look at his audience. His audience was largely common people. Jesus was criticized by re the religious elite for eating, drinking, and fellowshipping with sinful people. Jesus stood by a woman caught in adultery, and rather than condemning her, he granted her forgiveness and told her to go her way and sin no more. And then we think of the situation that Jesus um, was in with the uh, Samaritan woman 
how he met the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus completely stepped out of cultural norms of the day, and he spoke gently and graciously and respectfully to her, offering her eternal life. And then we see Jesus with the children and how the disciples had told them to go away, try to send them away because they were interfering with Jesus' itinerary. And what did Jesus do? He welcomed them. He took them in his arms and he blessed them. And time after time, we see the grace and the humility of Jesus as he engages people in conversation and reaches out to heal and to forgive. And if anyone had reason to shun people and to condemn people, it was Jesus Christ. For he alone was sinlessly perfect. And he knew the condition of men's hearts like no one else did or does. So it asks the question, how often have we distanced ourselves or disassociated ourselves from those who we consider to be unlovely or too sinful to associate with? That one hurts, doesn't it? How often have we distanced ourselves or disassociated ourselves from those who we consider to be unlovely or too sinful to associate with? How much more effective would our Christian witness be if we appropriated the grace and the humility of Jesus? And then we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And we picture this. Jesus Christ, perfect Son of God, eternal King of kings, Lord of lords, girding himself about with a towel, stooping down before his disciples, and washing their filthy feet. It's beyond comprehension. And then we come to the crucifixion. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, we read, And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a, Christ, of a cross. He humbled himself. Every act of indecency, brutality, and mockery was unleashed upon him. The hatred was absolutely demonic. And after his mock trial, he was stripped naked. He was nailed to a Roman cross and raised up for all to see. And to further mock and ridicule and hurl insults at him while he hung between two criminals. Those who crucified Jesus and the cheering crowd were so blinded by sin that they failed to see that the one they considered to be their enemy and their victim was now was actually their creator in human flesh. And yet Jesus never once retaliated. Never has there been seen a higher, nobler, and more perfect example of humility. What right have we to allow pride to take root in our hearts ever? Everything I have, everything I am, is granted from God. What right do I have to take offense? God calls us to be people of humility. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, It is better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Proverbs 15 and 33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor comes humility. Proverbs 22 and 4, The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and life. As you read these verses on humility, and, and remember the ones we read on pride, you see the difference? It's a total contrast. The attitude and the result. Pride and then failure or disaster, humility, and then honor. Proverbs 22 and 4 says, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Luke 14 and 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself shall be exalted. Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. 
Ephesians 4, 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Colossians 3 and 12, and so as those having been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then lastly, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 33 and 4 says, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. You know, we cannot come to God with pride. The scripture makes it very clear that God will not tolerate pride. And pride is the enemy that keeps many people from coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this child, he is granted, in the, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I'll read that again. Whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So to be born again and inherit eternal life and to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it requires humbling ourselves before God, admitting that we are sinners in need of forgiveness, and putting our trust in Jesus Christ to save us. And I know most of you have made that decision. It's pretty obvious, but maybe there's some that haven't. And if you're hearing me this morning talking about this and you haven't made that decision, you haven't humbled yourself before God, recognized the pride in your heart and the sin that that is, and that we have to humble ourselves before God, admitting our need for him and for forgiveness. When we do that, he will come in and he will make us a new creature and he will abide with us and he will give us peace and he will give us joy. And if you make that decision, that will be the best decision you'll ever make and you'll never regret it. And for those of you who are followers of Christ, it's still something that we struggle with, isn't it? We struggle with it daily. But may we increasingly be clothed with the humility of Christ and may we proudly bear his name. Did you catch that? May we increasingly be clothed in the humility of Christ and may we proudly bear his name. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much this morning for the instruction of your word and for the reminder of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for the perfect example he was and he is. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus was humble and through his humility, he reached out to mankind. In so many ways, he ministered to the poor, he healed the sick, but most of all, and greatest of all, he brought salvation to those who are lost and living in darkness. We thank you so much, Father, for the example of Jesus Christ. And we pray, oh God, this morning that we might be challenged as believers to clothe ourselves in the humility of Jesus Christ, that we may reflect his character to a world that needs to know. Thank you, God, for this time we've been able to spend around your word. We pray, oh, Father, that you would um, just cause your word to grow in our hearts and our minds this week. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean... If, if, uh, 